everyone, as you're coming in, um, do be advised, we'll probably begin a few minutes late as we're waiting for our wonderful moderator, Wajahat Ali. Um, so just get settled, feel cozy, write your audience questions, feel free to chat. Um, we'll begin momentarily. And folks viewing from home, welcome. We're glad to have you too.
Um, Where would you like to put this? They t- your book there. Oh, you could put it there. Oh, I asked him to. He didn't have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. It was up to you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're late because of me. <laughs> Yeah. It took me an hour and seven minutes when it usually takes 30 minutes, so. It's so ugly out there. Patient. It's like a pregnant pause, you know, just uh, <laughs> hide in the moment. You sh- you'd like to make a, a grand <laughs> entrance. Yeah, a grand, so. yeah. I, th- I thought, you know, just uh, wouldn't it be nice as a moderator of this conversation to just steal the thunder <laughs> uh, from the... Build from up the anticipation and then... Okay, so first and foremost, you do realize that Neil has written a book, correct? Who here has purchased the book? Who here has not so we can shame them publicly? All right. Brian. So you will, though, afterwards. Okay. Uh, Watching you. you know, <laughs> we got our eyes on you. Uh, you have been on a book tour. You're exhausted, but you're here in D.C. Thank you for joining us, sir. Happy to be here. Uh, you've been driving like crazy, right? Many hours. Eight yesterday to get to friend's house in northern Virginia. Eight the day before to get to Asheville, North Carolina. Eleven a few days before that. We do what it takes to sell a few books. Uh, you know, I was going to ask you about the book just to start off, but just to keep it personal for a second, how does it feel to be in person with people during the middle of a pandemic <laughs> actually discussing your book? I am uh, thrilled to be out in public. You know, I mean, we talked about this a little bit the other day. A lot of authors are out there doing Zoom calls and those kinds of events, which are great. You know, you can reach a big audience. I went out of my way with this uh, weird tour that I'm doing to, to get in front of booksellers, right. be in the store, talk to uh, uh, independent booksellers, and then meet with friends and f- you know family and f- uh, old friends. And I just wanted to talk in front of people and hopefully not contaminate them uh, with anything that I might be yes, carrying. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah we're, I'm, triple, I'm vaxxed and Same. boosted and negative yep. at least five days in a row, so let's see. <laughs> it, it is something because you know we, it, it's one of those situations where we could have easily Zoomed it, and I've been doing Zoom for t- like two years, yeah, and uh, th- and we Neil and I have actually never met before. We've been uh, email buddies. No, we met in a in a hotel room in Las oh, yeah, Vegas. There you go. <laughs> and then and then and then well, we didn't meet. He left an impression. But then, <laughs> uh, but I'm saying we haven't really kept in touch. Like we've been in, in been email in the whole time, and it is something. Even though it's a small crew, Neil's like lower your expectation. I'm like, man, the fact that we're just meeting in person <laughs> and being able to talk to people, it's a win. Uh, so thank you all for coming, and thank you for hosting us today. Yeah, um, thanks, Julia. It's the book, we could talk for a while about it, but it's, i got to start this way. When people think about the Kennedys, when, it, when you first told me about the book, First Kennedys, I was like, my, my spidey sense went to like, oh, he's going to talk about JFK, or he's going to talk about RFK, <coughs> or he's going to talk about maybe the dad, mm-hmm. who's a very interesting, controversial character, or he talked about John Jr., or he talked about Jackie. And then when, when you sent me the book, uh, I'm like, oh, he, he takes it back to the 19th century. Mm-hmm. He takes it to the 1860s. Of all the Kennedys, why focus on the OGs? The OGs, I like that. Um, you know, a lot's been written about this family, right? Like, that's stating the obvious. And I didn't want to tell another typical Kennedy story. I didn't want to find some niche version of the 20th century Kennedys to talk about. Um, I feel like it's been done. We kind of know that family. And I'm honestly not that interested in them. Um, what I wanted to know was where did these, w- I, I'm interested in, in them as a, as a thing, you know, the, the capital K, 20th century Kennedys, there's such mythology around them and around the tragedies and around the assassinations and all this. Yeah. And that makes them this family that they are, Camelot and the, and the sort of mythology around the royal family, America's royal family. What I wanted to know um, was where did that start? Right. Who came first? Right. Where did they come from? What was life like for them? You know, I generally knew that they were Irish and they came from Ireland. Uh, and, and, and that was kind of the gist of it. And as I started researching it, I realized almost every book starts with Joe, yeah. who's a second generation kid who turned his back on his Irish heritage, just wanted to be known as American. So I wanted to know, well, that among the questions was how does a second generation kid turn his back on all of that? So what was it about his grandparents and 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 what was life like for them? I'm half Irish, was raised Catholic. I knew a little bit about the the intense hatred toward those people back in that day, uh, and I wanted to explore that as well. Not, so not just a Kennedy book, but uh, um, an 18th century immigration story. Yeah, so I mean, it's interesting because it's not just an 18th century immigration story. When you read the book, it's like, oh, 
This sounds very topical. <laughs> this is what they're saying about uh, the darkies and the invaders and my people and the shithole country folks. Yep. And we oftentimes forget that, and I, I have questions for you for about that, but I want to take the DeLorean back because oftentimes we don't connect history, uh -huh. right? And so you're talking about, you want to take this back to the 1860s. Let's take it back to the OGs. You got these protagonists. The main protagonist, in my opinion, I is Bridget, yeah. uh, right? And then you have Patrick. Now, Bridget and Patrick, uh, don't know each other at this time. They're both in Ireland. They're both single. Mm -hmm. uh, and they both decide to come to America. <coughs> I think it's important for people to understand, can you explain the conditions in Ireland at that time that would inspire a young single woman by herself to get on a ship? Dangerous ship. Uh, yeah, what was the coffin ship? Coffin ship. <laughs> yeah, so what, was the, what were the conditions like for the Irish in the homeland? Yeah, terrible. I mean, <laughs> so the, the, the situation at the time was... Um, Ireland had been invaded by England. It was a colony of England. Mm -hmm. England, in, the English hated the Irish. They hated uh, this sort of stain on their on on, on their reputation as a as a uh, as a colonizer. Um, and uh, the p story sort of picks up with Bridget and Patrick at one of the lowest moments among many in Irish history, which is the pa potato famine yeah. of the 1840s. Right. So these are all poor. Uh, farmers who lease their land from absentee English landlords. The Irish can't even, for the most part, own their own land. They are tenants mm -hmm. on their own land. Um, and when the potato famine hits, uh, the Irish who mainly subsisted on the potatoes because they had to raise other crops to pay their landlords off. Um, so people starve, people get sick and die. And in the case of Bridget and Patrick, many people said, we're out of here. Things are shitty anyway here. Um, what do you got to lose? Yeah, let's get out. And and so sh I find it remarkable that this this woman who has never left, you know, the 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 circumference of a few miles of her humble little, truly like a peasant farm, um, has the initiative and the and the grit to get on one dangerous ship to go to Liverpool and then another bigger, more dangerous ship to come to America alone. And what I loved, too, about Bridget and other women like her is that she was part of this wave of women who outnumbered the men coming to yeah. America. The only, uh, you know, ethnic group in the 1800s where the women came in larger numbers than the men and alone. And I think it's important to note that not only were the Irish despised at the time, women <laughs> weren't really that high on the list. Right. <laughs> right. So, so she's got, she has two marks against her, and she's single. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, throughout the book, uh, for those who are going to read it, it's, uh, she's like, I think we could say she's a badass. Yeah, totally. Because yeah, she's like, she comes from nothing, and then you see where she ends up, and without her, there's nothing. Yeah. There's no Camelot without her. Yep. So she, c she makes it, okay? Can you, can you talk about the coffin ship? Like, yeah. why was it called the coffin ship? <laughs> Because people died in large numbers ac coming across the ocean. I mean, you know, it, this was at a, ta a time when um, people weren't hopping the QE2 to come to America for vacation, right? Like, people just didn't cross the ocean on ships for leisure. Or, or if they could avoid it, they wouldn't do it at all. Yeah. This was desperation. These were refugees escaping a crumbling country. Yeah. Um, and so they would do whatever it took to make it to some place that they felt might be a little bit safer. Um, these ships, many of them were converted uh, slave ships, um, and there were cramped quarters under uh, below decks, and there was not enough food to go around. A lot of the Irish were coming from this terrible situation in their homeland. Many of them were already sick or starving. So when they finally make it to this ship, they bring their disease aboard. People are dying of disease along the way, and I describe scenes of just bodies being plunked into the Atlantic on the way over. Mm. You know, the, the the bottom of the Atlantic littered with Irish bones. Um, mm. These ships crashed. They burned to the ground. They weren't well maintained, especially the English ships because they didn't give a crap. Yeah. Um, so uh, like again, you're Irish. Who gives a shit? Like you're yeah, yeah. You're just we'll, luggage. We'll cram a bunch of you yeah. in the hold down below, and we'll give you half the water and food that we're required to by maritime law. Um, so there are scenes, you know, and I got these from diaries of people who made this crossing. Um, you know, bodies being wrapped in cloth and just plunked overboard, just plunk, plunk, plunk all the way across. Kids being born at sea, but there's no doctors aboard. Kids dying at sea, being tossed overboard. So just to make it to America in the first place, that was the first big hurdle. Survival was victory. Yeah. yeah. But then she gets to the, the dock at East Boston where she landed um, and swarms of people just like her carrying, you know, a bag or two on their back and immediately realize everybody's 
here is poor and desperate and terrified like I am. And then just behind that horde is the welcoming Bostonians who say, <laughs> what are you doing here? They were very happy, I think, to embrace the Irish, right? To, in Boston. To, to quote a good book, <laughs> why don't you go back to where you came right. from? That, I mean, that's what they faced day one. And, you know, the book starts with, you have, a, you have a preface in the book that talks about, like, why you decided to, you know, do the book in the first place and the death of John Jr. But then the book really starts with the introduction where uh, it's an interesting scene where you start the book. It begins at the burial of Patrick, her mm. husband. Uh, and I thought it was like a, a really powerful microcosm of how the Irish were treated. What, you know, can you tell us about that beginning point of this book at the death and yeah. the burial, the actual coffin of Patrick? Right, yeah. Um, so yeah, Bridget makes it to America. She uh, meets Patrick, who's from the same county she came from. They marry, they start a family. First son, John F. Kennedy, dies yeah. at 20 months of disease because they lived in you know, overcrowded tenement apartments in East Boston. Um, and Patrick dies of consumption. The average life expectancy in America for a male uh, Irish immigrant at that time was 14 years. They would make it 14 wow. years. Patrick, he was 35, 36? 35, yeah. yeah. So he made it 10 years. Wow. Didn't even make it to the 14. Wow. Kids, uh, first uh, American-born kids of Irish immigrants, life expectancy, five years. John F. Kennedy, the first John, makes it 20 months. So this is, this is Bridget's reality during her first decade in America. Three daughters and one son left. Correct, yep, yeah. yep. And so... Single mom, four kids. Yeah. L youngest son is 10 months old when Patrick, her husband, dies. Um, and so the opening scene is her leaving her island of East Boston, which is just across from the north end of Boston, to go to Cambridge to bury Patrick because she's not allowed to bury his Irish Catholic body in Boston soil. There are no Catholic cemeteries in city limits. There are laws to prevent this. There's, or, sh sorry, there is one. There was one Catholic cemetery, but it's always full, or it's always being shut down by the city for some violation. So there is no place to bury Catholics in Boston, which we now think of as the most it's Irish wildest Catholic. Thing to say. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we got a you know a Bostonian here or a Massachusetts and uh, at least one that I know of in the audience. And to think that that was a a, a city that didn't want the Irish at all and they couldn't bury their loved ones inside city limits. So the scene is her at the funeral of Patrick, burying him and wondering, now what? Like I wanted to introduce her at this low moment and show, because of, you know, you alluded to what she becomes eventually. Right. She is a badass. But when she starts out, she, uh, the Kennedy family could have ended that day right. when pa Patrick was sunk into the ground in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm going to talk about the, it's because this, it's not that long ago. People are like, oh, back in the day, we're like 130 years, 150 years, that's it. Like this country hated the Irish. Mm -hmm. And even with JFK, which we're going to talk about, people forget that JFK had to give his loyalty oath yeah. uh, before becoming president. Like people casually forget this and they think, oh, it's back in the day. You're like, ah, it's 60 years ago. It's not, yeah. too, not too much. Uh, I want to get to the arc of, of Bridget. But before I do, I really wanted to talk about the researcher because and also as just the craft of writing, because you have to imagine being Bridget, mm -hmm. but then at the same time as a historical fiction writer, like I have to hold my back from the melodrama, right? But like yeah. you have to also flourish the scenes, but then you also have this treasure trove of research. So first question is, how did you get the research that no one else got? <laughs> uh, it was it was it felt like I was trying to solve a mystery. Like I when I got started on this, I thought early on, or I should say I realized early on, oh, that's why nobody's written this book before. It, there's, not, there's not that just easily accessible there were no tweets packet of information like, no TikToks. here's a box with Bridget's <laughs> life story, you yeah. just have to find the box. Um, it was hard, and there were multiple sources, and there were many fits and starts with this project. I, I went to Ireland to, in 2006, went to the Kennedy homestead where Patrick Kennedy, Bridget's husband, was from, met family members, got some documentation there, was starting to roll, and then went to Bridget's uh, former farm, which is a pile of rocks in the grass. Like, nothing about Bridget, mm. nothing in the newspapers. I thought, oh, shit, like, how am I going to bring... I wanted to bring her to life. I wanted this to be Bridget's story more than anything. You know, Patrick's dead, right? Uh, and the Kennedy uh, story overall has been so male dominated. I wanted to show right. it really all started with this one badass woman. How do I bring her to life? Um, a lot of it was archival research in Boston. You know, I went to the obvious places. I went to the JFK Library and um, dug into their archives. There, they were willing to help. They said, Yeah, we don't know a whole lot about Bridget either. Good luck. 
Uh, I went to family members. You know, they there's John and, 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 R and RFK and, and John Jr. you could write yeah, about. Yeah, you can over here. Here are the stacks on those guys. Yeah. But Bridget, no, no stacks yeah. on Bridget. Family members, same deal. Like, hey, we're excited you're writing about this. Let us know what you find Good out. Good luck. We can't help you. <laughs> Across the board, Maria Shriver, I saved her note. Um, sorry I can't help with your book. I look forward to reading it and learning more about my own family. They just didn't know. They didn't go back that Did you far. send her a book? I did. Okay, good. Yeah. It, um, but, I mean, it's one of the situations, like, so you said 2006, so I did the math, even though I'm an <laughs> English major, and I think that's 16 years, right? Did I get that right? Okay. Roughly. So, yeah, so, like, 16, like, in the, that's a long time. And then I'd put it aside. I'd realize, oh, that I can't, I, I'm not getting, you know, her diary or her collected letters yeah. to, to be able to do justice to her story. I wanted to do justice to it. Um, but what actually inspired me, and I, uh, I'm happy to talk a lot about this piece of the, uh, the story, what inspired me was 2016 election. Mm. We start hearing, go back where you came from, send them back, build a wall, all the things that Bridget was hearing as soon as she got to America. I thought, I got to figure this out. I got to put her in that context of being faced with that kind of just aggressive hatred for her kind, Irish, Catholic, female, um, the same kind of shit we heard in recent years, and I wanted to show that. I wanted to bring it to life that that population of people and Bridget in particular were, were um, you know, despised. There was a political party created to keep them in their place or send them back. Uh, and there were just so many echoes to recent years that I wanted to find, you know, so draw that, some. So interesting that Trumpism, 10 years after you began, kind of reignited the spark. It did, yeah. Yeah. Like I gotta tell Bridget's story. Yeah, yeah, and, and 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 that coincided with to your question about research, um, the JFK Library, um, finally uh, posting the JF or the PJ Kennedy papers, oh, posting right. the, a link to the Ken the papers that were in process being digitized and you know stay tuned. So I thought, oh, I got time. I can wait for this. <laughs> I've waited 10 years. And it took four years for them wow. to actually finish them. I was like more than halfway through the book, and I thought, well, screw it. I'm not going to get the PJ papers. And then they were gracious at the library, and I nagged them. I was a jerk. Um, and they finally said, okay, okay, okay. Here's two-thirds of the papers. Like, shut up. Um, and they were great. They were remarkable. It, it, uh, we'll get to PJ, but, you know, this is Bridget's Respectful son. persistence pays off. And PJ is the son of Bridget who then – becomes the first, if you will, of the, the political leaders of the Kennedys, right? Right. right. Uh, and we'll talk about PJ because you devote the last third of the book t uh, to PJ. I'm glad those papers came in. Yeah, and they, they'd help bring, bring him to life and, and, and uh, help me understand a little bit more about Bridget and her influence on PJ and all those things. But the last thing about research was yeah. newspapers.com. Um, had never, I, maybe I'd heard of it, but I'd never used it. Uh, m the Mormon Church, uh, S uh, LDS, has digitized like every piece of paper on the planet. And I did not know that. Uh, Ancestry.com, all the, the, the yeah. genealogical sites, oh, yeah. myheritage.com, familysearch.com, it's all LDS church. And I didn't know they were behind this too, newspapers.com. I was able to, and I did, every day read the pages of 1800s newspapers. Like just flip through the Boston Globe, page after page after page. You can search and find stuff. So I was able to search for the Know Nothing, search for Boston grocery shops, because wow. that's what Bridget did, search for Irish maids. Um, but then I would just get lost flipping the pages. And all those different approaches to the research helped me hopefully bring together, bring to life the world around Bridget, even if I couldn't get at her specific experience like directly. Yeah, but it, it reads like in a, as a very fluid narrative, and I'm like the research plus your 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 talents as a writer helps guide you through it. So ten years paid off, my friend. <laughs> well, fifteen years, I should say. So I want to I want to read you some quotes, okay? Yeah. Quote: Americans must rule America. These Muslim immigrants are aliens and enemies of the state. They're a fifth column. They will never assimilate. They will outbreed the local population. Okay, I was lying. It's not Muslims, it was actually Catholics. <laughs> Everything I just said was said about the Catholics in the 19th century, which is exactly what is being said about Syrians and Haitians and- You name it. You name it. Now we went from Ireland, let's take it to America. Mm. What was it about the Irish in particular that made the Native Americans at the time <laughs> despise them so much? Um, religion was one. 
I Absolutely. think probably the main thing they they didn't understand it. They felt that the, these Irish were coming here. I mean, there were there were literally conspiracy theories back then. Again, resonant to today. Um, guys like uh, I mentioned him in the book, uh, Samuel Morse, creator of the telegraph and Morse code. Conspiracy theorists. He wrote a book called "The Conspiracy to Like Take Over the United States: The Foreign right. Plot to Take Over America," um, and inst instill uh, or install, you know, a Catholic uh, as president, and and the Pope in Rome. It took a hundred years. You guys finally did it, <laughs> right. but yeah, yeah, it was a little delay. Check. <laughs> um, but the, the people were freaked out. I mean, right. w it was the first large-scale influx of refugees to this country. You know, we claim to be a nation of immigrants and, and kind of sort of are, uh, depending on how you define that. But, um, you know, up until the Irish potato famine and, and suddenly you've got tens of thousands of refugees coming to this country, it had always been trickles from here and there. Um, that doesn't mean we welcome them with open arms either. I mean, the, the nativist nonsense has been around since the very beginning, right. and I talk about that in the book. Um, but when the Irish came, people went bonkers. Um, they were poor, they talked funny, um, uh, they, were from, they were Catholic, you know, and, and this country just didn't want them like we don't want many other uh, uh, immigrants no matter where they come from, um, some more than others. Uh, but I found it remarkable that the, ha the hatred was so intense and the violence was intense. I mean, you know, I describe a, a, a scene at Quinn's Row in Louisville, um, uh, Louisville um, Kentucky, where a band of these thugs, because there were many of these like Proud Boy-like groups uh, around at the time, went on a rampage uh, through through this Irish neighborhood, um, burning down the brewery and eventually killing a priest. And uh, I think, I forget, there was like 100 people killed in this rampage, just anti-Catholic rage. Mm. A convent burned outside of Boston. Um, um, you know, and in, and in Bridget's fear, where she was, just people marching down the street, uh, protesting their kind on a regular basis, throwing bricks through their windows, trying to shut down their businesses. Um, it's not just the Know Nothing Party that would oppose them, but the Prohibition Party, which tried to shut down Irish bu businesses, many of which were involved you know, in the liquor trade of some sort, grocery stores or saloons, both of which enter into my story. Um, so there was, just, there was just this incredible hatred and, and aggressive violence toward their kind, and they wanted to send them back, or if they couldn't, keep them oppressed and down and out of politics, out of elected office, prevent them from becoming citizens, whatever it took to keep them poor and, uh, you know, uh, unsuccessful. It's interesting because they say, I mean, you know, America's for Americans and, and the signs back in the day people forget now that the Irish Catholic, we'll talk about this, are seen as integrated and part and parcel of whiteness in America. Mm. There used to be signs that said, no N-words, no dogs, no Irish. Yeah. Uh, and and that, was the uh, that was the 20th century. <coughs> Uh, this is nothing, you know, it's not that new. And I remember um, in the last 10 years, especially if you guys have been paying attention, uh, <laughs> this country really is not a fan of uh, Muslims. and <laughs> Those people come from shithole countries. I've heard. What they were saying about Sharia and the mosques, I, the, uh, the way I try to connect the dots, and the, you see the light bulbs go off in audiences. I'm like, they used to say the same thing about Catholics, and they used to ban Catholic uh, churches, and they used to protest the construction of Catholic churches. Yeah. So it's the exact same. You just have to replace Muslim with Catholic, and it's just like a beautiful fit. Yeah. <laughs> and, and we seem to not, we seem to forget the connection, right? And I want to talk about like why we forget and why we don't forget, but you keep mentioning the know-nothings, and some people might not know. You know, we see a remake of what's happening, right? You mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're seeing tag it, you're the Irish, we don't like you. Chinese, Chinese Exclusion Act, we don't like you. Japanese, we don't like you. Eastern European Jews, we don't like you. Mexicans, we don't like you. Now it's the Muslims mm -hmm. and the Muslim immigrants, we don't like you. Coinciding with the rise of the Irish, there was also the rise of nativist parties. Yeah. It's like the cycle in America. So talk to us about how okay, the Irish come. Now you get people saying, my opportunity to run for politics. Tell me about how that coincided with the rise of the know nothing. Yeah. Well, first, uh, to, to address your, your uh, well-put description of these cycles that we've yeah. been through over time, um, my wife has called it, it, likens it to herpes, right? <laughs> Like it flares up. <laughs> nativism is our is our national herpes. That's right. You know, it, it might go under a little bit of remission, but it's always under the surface, and then it's like flares into these like disgusting boils like we've had in recent years. And so you know, it's 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 always been here. It's always been part of who we are. It's just aimed at different groups in different ways. Um, but with the Irish, um, you know, they come here in these large large numbers, right? And and suddenly a town like Boston. Um, 
is more than half Irish. Uh, and uh, even though there's this political party, the Know Nothing Party, which is an uh, umbrella term for a lot of uh, political organizations that were created uh, mainly against Irish, but also other immigrants. Um, they, they were known as the Native American Party, which is you know, <laughs> nonsense on its own. Uh, the, the American Party, um, I mentioned Samuel Morris. He ran for mayor of New York uh, as a, a Native American Party candidate. Um, and these, these candidates all campaigned on a platform of, um, you know, the, the Catholics are coming to take your jobs and, and you know, rape your women and, and uh, you know, ruin your life, increase taxation and all these. America first. Things. Yeah. I mean, it was. Yeah, that's a, and it's a remake. It's, it's, these aren't original thinkers that we have. Right. <laughs> right. And they were terrifyingly successful in the like mid 1850s. Yeah. Um, was was one of their peaks. One of the herpes uh, outbreaks was the mid 1850s. Um, governor and most of the state house in Massachusetts were no no nothing candidates who won, um, and they tried to act all these enact all these laws to keep uh, Irish from being citizens and being running for office and these kind of efforts. Um, and it rattled the Irish. And in it took a little while, but they realized uh, if we're gonna fight back against this hatred, these efforts to keep us down, we're gonna have to get into politics too, right? right? So in time, you see the beginnings of much of it in Boston, some of it in New York and other cities, but I focus on Boston because PJ Kennedy, who's this dude here, um, is part of this first wave of first generation Irish kids who get involved in politics as a way to protect their people, uh, you know, get, get, create opportunities for their people, push back against these idiots who are trying to, to keep them down or send them back. And it's a remarkable and really transformative period right. where you see, you know, like you said, the rise of the know nothings, the, the, the Irish saying, well, wait a second, fuck you. We, we're here too. We are We're Americans. not going back. Yeah, we're not going back. We are Americans also, dummies. Um, and, uh, and then <laughs> there's this just incredible period starting like 1880s where you've got the first elected uh, Irish Catholic mayor of Boston, 1885, Hugh O'Brien. And then a year later, P.J. Kennedy and his uh, contemporary John F. Fitzgerald run for st uh, state office. And then you see this slow but pretty uh, fast growing rise of the Irish politician. The first time, you know, we think of that as being a, almost a trope. Um, uh, and and the, all the negative things that came with that later, patronage and graft and and that nonsense, but at the time, it was just a desperate fight to uh, gain agency for themselves um, in, in elected office. The parallel reminds me, if you do the math, right, so it took about 20, 25 years. So if you're talking about the next generation, you're talking about the kids, the yeah. firstborn, like the PJs, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you see it with just the war on terror 20 years ago, right, my generation, right, <coughs> war on terror happens, all of us were like, oh, we're American, oh, we're not American. Uh, <laughs> We're us and them. We're told to go back, even though we were born and raised in this country. And then it happened when I was a senior. And then, like, just clockwork, all of us were supposed to go in one direction. So many of us then went politics, law, education. Like, it was just like Journalism. a fl flip of the switch. And then you fast forward 20 years, and now you're seeing elected Muslim officials, yeah. people saying, yeah, I'm not going to become a doctor. I'm going to actually go in, like, politics. I'm going to go journalism. I'm going to write my stories. It took, like, a 25-year arc. And that arc happened as a result of this moment of crisis where you're like, I'm not going to F this. Yeah. I'm going to fight back. Yeah. Well, I think about some of the politicians we see now, you know, Rashida Ch uh, Tahib and, yeah. and, um, uh, and, and uh, Keith Ellison earlier in, in Minnesota and now uh, Omar. And, you know, it, these are the ones who are breaking through finally and, and, and getting elected and proving that they can lead a, in ways that the Irish were just beginning to do at this period that we're talking about. It's the same sort of breakthrough and trans transition. I, I want to talk about the, the parallels later and then the differences between the Irish immigrants and uh, the other immigrants, how the Irish were able to eventually assimilate for better and for worse. Right. But you mentioned PJ. And so here's Bridget. Let's take it back to Bridget real quick, who's the badass of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, four kids, the youngest is PJ, who's the son. She doesn't have skills, she's, she's doing labor, she's doing like a uh, hairdresser. Right. Started as a maid like every other Bridget did. They were known as Bridgets. Maid, hairdresser. How does she make the arc to grocer? Because <coughs> I think without her becoming the grocer, an independent businesswoman, the story would end. Yeah, yeah. 
No, she could have ended up a maid and her daughters could have ended up maids and it would have all just ended right there, right? Yeah. Like, you're right. I think something, and again, this is a challenge with uh, something that ha occurred so long ago and a, you know, a poor widowed Im immigrant widow who didn't leave her papers behind. We don't know everything, but we know this much. You know, worked as a maid for many years. Um, at some point, it's almost, uh, I don't put it this way in the book, but it's almost as if after Patrick died, after her husband died, she was like, oh shit, I gotta, I gotta Crisis. figure this out. So she sends for a niece to come over and watch her kids. She goes back to work, but not a, 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 as a maid in a household. Uh, she works at a fancy hotel in East Boston that was just built by the richest guy in East Boston. Through that, I think she makes some connections because soon after that, she ends up working at the Jordan Marsh department store in downtown Boston as a hairdresser. One account says she rose to become chief hairdresser in the women's department at Jordan Marsh. Um, maybe true, maybe not, but she did learn skills in that role that then helped her decide at some point to take this risk and open her own business, which maybe it's obvious, but just wasn't done. You know, an immigrant widow maid, ex-maid, didn't just like open single her own mom. shop. A single mom, four kids. Um, but it, that's, I think that was the turning point for her and for the family and sets up what's, what's to come. And I think it just says a lot about her that she was willing to do it. If Patrick had lived, she would have needed his permission and a special license, uh, married woman doing business as license. And he would have Mrs. had to sign Mrs. Patrick up. Yeah. Kennedy. Uh, yeah. And instead, she does it on her own. Um, in all the business directories that I found, she was always described as the widow Kennedy. So oh. she couldn't even get away from that tag. Right, she was. She I think I think that's what's remarkable about the story is like the 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 like yeah, they said the patriarchal Kennedy dynasty because we usually just mention the men, yeah, and then Jackie, yeah, right, <laughs> Maria. <laughs> it's like no, it was like a woman, yeah, a woman who just like survived through grit, resilience, uh, you know, hard work, creativity. Without her, it's nothing. It's nothing, and and even more remarkable than just owning that business, which is enough. Um, in time, it's successful enough, and she takes out a mortgage. She buys mm. the building where the grocery shop is. She buys the building next door. She becomes landlord to the tenants who live in these apartments above her, many of them Irish immigrants coming over for the first time. Two of those uh, male immigrants become her sons-in-law because they meet her daughters who are working at the shop with her. So she creates this hub, this little community um, you know, nexus that uh, I, I think sets up uh, what becomes a PJ next and is why she earned at her death. She dies in 1888 at age 67, we think. Um, records weren't great back then, but um, she gets an obituary in the Boston Globe. Which is huge. It's just uh, for, you know, anybody. It's a, it's a recognition of something that they accomplished, but for her to have gone from, you know, that opening scene that we talked about and, and all alone to uh, being recognized as a woman of many noble and charitable traits, as the Boston Globe put it, uh, says a lot about her remarkable ascent and, and how, what an important figure she is in the, in the history of this family. You know, we talk about PJ and the, as the sky, but I think even PJ's origin story is pretty amazing because he could have gone different ways, right? So he's 10 months old. Mom has four kids, including him. He has no father figure. He's first born uh, Irish. Even they weren't really that popular. Yeah. Even though, you know, like mostly, not really born here, but he was a baby when he came here, right? Like, so the, all he knows is America. Doesn't have the accent. Uh, and he's a young boy, <coughs> and he goes to Deer Island. <laughs> Can you explain, because, like, what a terrible place that was and how he ab was able to survive even that? Yeah, that was a, that was a hellhole. <coughs> Deer Island is this island. I think it's connected by land now, but it's where Boston put all the undesirable uh, institutions, you know, penal colonies, the quarantine hospital, the insane asylum, um, and then the home for juvenile delinquents. I forget the exact name of it. <clears throat> Initially, it was held up as like a, a, a model for how to um, imprison people, right? Like, they're not downtown, they're like over on this island and, and we're keeping them separated. Here the adults are over here and the prostitutes are here and the truant boys are over here. Over time, that whole system collapsed. It's very enlightened. Yeah, yeah. Right? And people came and did tours of this place and, wow. and they, they were very proud of it. And then the whole system of keeping people separated collapsed and it was just one big penal colony, essentially, at times. Um, and he goes there as a boy. He goes there as a 12-year-old boy. We don't know how long he spent there. The records don't show exactly what he did, but there were uh, many records of kids his age who were just picked up for truancy. 
Um, and I think that's probably what he was there for. You know, fatherless kid, mom's busy working at the grocery shop. He's roaming around, getting into trouble, not going to school. We know he doesn't, didn't have a good education as a kid. Um, and I think he got picked up for being on the streets and not going to school and sent there for a period of time. And it was just a hellhole. I, I, you know, it's remarkable that he survived that episode and then comes out of it. But in time, he kind of gets his shit together, starts to work on the docks of East Boston long as shoreman. a longshoreman. Um, bartender. Bartender. But, you know, the reason why that's important, because you look at JFK, right? We have the myth. Because most people think Kennedys, Blue Bloods, aristocrats, Boston, well-spoken, right? Uh, pretty, good fashion, mm -hmm. nice hair. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's the good image. Teeth. Pr good teeth. Pretty. <laughs> clean like that's that's the white america that's yeah. the white irish catholic america that's that's our alphas yeah and then you see pj truant who <laughs> <laughs> survives deer island barely, barely. probably traumatized mm -hmm. longshoreman longshoreman and kennedy don't go together no bartender right and and so you're reading this and you have these <laughs> chapters in your book you're like pj the longshoreman pj the bartender so i'm sitting there thinking like he's still a young guy he's in his early 20s he's not he's not groomed like uh, like the father groomed JFK and mm -hmm. RFK, right? Mm -hmm. He's just hustling. He's yeah. a hustler. Mm -hmm. How does a hustler in his early 20s, or let me put it this way, what qualities did he have that the elders at that time said, this guy has a future? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there were a, a number of qualities that he had. Uh, and I, I d there's one just scene where I describe him. Here he is behind the bar. Here's, here's what he looks like. Here's how Rose Fitzgerald would later describe him. He... Um, he was a good listener. Um, he cared about what other people needed and wanted. Um, I mentioned the P.J. Kennedy papers. Yeah. The, they, this comes through in those one after the other after the other. Even later, as he's a big, become a big success and he gets out of politics, all he thinks about was, how do we help this poor kid? Mm. And I think that started early on. I think it came from his mother. Like He inherited this sense of, how do we help the, 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 our people? Um, you know, uh, succeed in this in this place that doesn't want he us. He had the roots. So yeah, yeah, he did, and it was instilled in him probably from his mother because that's how he was raised. He was raised by his mother, his aunt who came over, his older sisters, nieces. I mean, he was influenced by the women, strong women in his life. He didn't have a father figure, um, and so he gets to be starts uh, working as a bartender and then owns his own saloon. And a lot of what he did was like help people. They'd come to his bar, hey, I'm looking for a job. Oh, go and see so-and-so. Oh, you need a loan? Well, here's $2, that's all I can do, go and see so-and-so. Um, you need a meal? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of food, maybe a drink, but you know, here's how you navigate this new land that you just came to that doesn't want you. So right from the start, he was a helper and a fixer. He was discreet. Um, he wasn't uh, a cocky guy like some of the other politicians he ended up working with, like John Fitzgerald. Um, I think he just genuinely wanted to help other people. And so little by little, this leads him uh, toward politics because the ward leaders, it was all like sort of ward-driven politics. Right. Local politics. Local politics. So the it, PJ's in Ward 2, which is East Boston. The ward leaders say, hey, you got a little something here. Why don't you come help us? Go you know, knock on doors and tell people who to vote for on, on November or whatever. Uh, we need somebody to help uh, raise some money for this uh, dance that we're doing or for, to raise money for the land leagues back in Ireland to send back to help our people back home. And people, PJ would just volunteer and do the work and put his head down and little by little they said, okay, this guy's got his shit together. He knows how to organize. He knows how to manage people. He knows how to raise money. He wasn't a good public speaker. Um, that was stated many times. Uh, I think he was better behind the scenes um, but little by little, he uh, uh, learns what people want to hear from a politician, and he gets elected to the state legislature, 1885. Um, and he just, just skyrockets after. From that. there, just like soars. Uh, at the, he was elected seven, five times in a row to the House, which was the first time that had ever happened. Um, that someone had served repeatedly from his uh, district. Then two years in the state senate. Then he pulls back. Partly because he's running all these businesses on the side, too. He started with just a saloon or two. Now he's got, like, three saloons, a liquor retail place. He's getting into wholesaling. Um, during his time in the uh, state legislature, he uh, opened a bank with some buddies. They got into real estate. He was involved in this social club. Um, he got into coal. I mean, Still he was Irish just Catholic. Oof, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which, is, which is key, because it's not like things are really good for the Irish right now. No, it's not like things cracked open. Yeah. People said, okay, you guys can, you, you're okay now. You can start to work. Yeah. They had to fight for all of it. Yeah. Um, 
but uh, I, he was just a, uh, the type of politician that I think his part of Boston needed and the, his bosses, the ward bosses, saw that and gave him an opportunity to prove himself. You know, there, th you, I've, I've, t I've touched upon this a little bit, but you see PJ has his roots, connected to his community, still Irish, reminded that he's Irish. The Irish, unlike other groups, right, even though they've had this history, they've been able to integrate and assimilate into whiteness. Mm -hmm. You know, now they're seen as American as apple pie. Uh, the rest of us still haven't because we're not white. Yep. And we'll never be white and we'll never be integrated. And I think there's a shift here between PJ and then his son. Yeah. Right. And there's a quote that says, Joe Kennedy inherited his father's business acumen, a friend observed, <laughs> but not his soul. <laughs> right. And, and maybe I'm reading too much into this. But then Joe, like you mentioned, he's like, nah, I'm done. I'm assimilating. Yeah. I'm going all the way into the American dream. And do you think that was the cost of assimilation in a little bit? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's an interesting word because I think that, that there was a lot of tension around that idea. How, far, how much do we assimilate into this country or how, and how much do reta we retain of, a, of who we actually are? You know, our dialect and our our, our uh, traditions and our religion and, you know, how we uh, think about things here in America. Th I quote regularly from this uh, newspaper called the Boston Pilot, Catholic newspaper, really influential in the lives of Irish Catholics at that time. And a lot of the stories and editorials s wagged their finger at the Irish and said, you shall assimilate. Just or else, or else, become American. Like get with the program. Become American. Yeah. Whatever that means. Uh, right. Whatever that means. And so they were like sort of hounded into getting with the program and just getting along. Mm. You know, not um, uh, continuing to think of themselves as hyphenated, as Irish American. They were supposed to be American. And I think with Joe, he picked up on that and ran with it. In fact, uh, I think we touched on this uh, in your when we were talking about your questions. J PJ's wife. Mary Augusta Hickey, I was gonna ask about that. yeah, decides uh, when Joe, who's the eldest son uh, of PJ and Mary, is born. She says, "I don't, no Patrick, no PJ. I don't want any more Patricks running around this house. He's going to be Joe. He, he's going to have an Patrick American was name, an Irish, an name. Irish name, and it's a monarch. And if you're an other, if yeah. he's Patrick, he's going to get hazed. Yeah, it's like he's got Patrick yeah. on his forehead. Um, there were no Bridgets. There were no more Bridgets in that family. I mean, there might have been in the extended Kennedy family a Bridget here and there." Um, but they decided no more overtly Irish names. We're going to get with the program here. Joe. In America. Joe, right. Yeah. How more American is that? Safe. Quick aside on Bridget, because um, uh, I mentioned in the book, toward the tail end, my Irish immigrant grandmother was Bridget. When she came here at Ellis Island, she changed her name to Della because mm. she didn't want to be known as a Bridget, which was you know, a, sh a, a, a shortcut nickname for a maid, which is what she was when she came here. That's, why I, you know, that's such, so, so fascinating that... The Bridgets were the, the maids. Yeah, totally. And, and, and now, uh, I'm going to, by the way, if you guys have questions, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to ask them. Uh, we have 10 minutes. But um, it's interesting how things change because just the parallels, right, real quick. Uh, the story about the name, which is why I brought it up to him, is the last five years, my friends who are born and raised in this country are self-policing their <coughs> unborn children's names. And what hmm. I mean by that is the casually we were talking and the, my friend, our friend was pregnant. She goes, what should I name my son? If I name him Adam, white people will think it's Adam. And they like Layla, which is also a Muslim name, but it'll be safe. And I paused the conversation. and I'm like, do you realize what we're just doing right now? <laughs> we are choosing safe names. Yeah. So our brown skin kids will have a better chance. Well, and you write about it in, in your book yourself. Yeah. Like, you, you know, you, you describe how you, your, was it your, your uh, grandfather? Yeah. You know, put his name, his finger on on the W, uh, and you 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 were named Wajahat, and you later very mainstream name. By later, the way. wished like wi why couldn't why couldn't I have been Wally? Yeah, or, or Wilbur. Name yeah. me Wilbur. Yeah, because yeah. we were reading Charlotte's Web. <laughs> Give me an American name. I said at the age of six because I used to get teased and m made fun of. And then also the parallels to you know who is the good immigrant and the bad immigrant. I think people forget because if you had gone 50 years ago and said, all right, in the Supreme Court. Uh, seven of the nine justices would be uh, a Catholic, and one would be a Jew. No, two would be Jews. Uh, no, six of the nine would be Catholic, one would be a Protestant, two would be Jews. People would be like, that's a hilarious joke. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And now look at our Supreme Court. Yeah. Or, or if you had two presidents, right? Or if you even look, I just crossed the street here, I was in the parking lot. You see a lot of the ethnic 
ethnic communities here. Mm-hmm. And they're all banded together. I don't know if you guys have crossed here, right? The, they got like the grocery stores, you got the restaurants, you got, they're all sticking together. And I, I just th- thought of your book, I'm like, the Irish were like this 150 years ago. Yeah. They yeah. all come together, you get a group, you get a community, you help each other out, and then one person rises, two yeah. people rise. Right, yeah, and we're seeing some of that happen now. I mean, it's gonna take a while. We're not, yeah. we're not ready for, you know, uh, what I think should be happening uh, in terms of that, that, like that rapid amount of change, but you know, some glimmers of hope here and there. But the you know the assimilation question is an interesting one. When the when the Irish came, they were all banded together in in Boston and in New York, and there were little pockets, and they were scolded, "Go west, like break it up, get out of here, like go mingle, go become you know." So I was I I think a lot about this idea of melting pot, um, which to me means you melt together and all become the same. Like that's assimilate. Get rid of your accent. Get rid of your language, and you know, just become sort of, you know, the color of carrot soup or something, yeah, yeah. right? I, uh, you know, gumbo is more interesting to me. Yeah. You know, because you retain who you are. You're individual, and you, and you you're know, integrated. You trip, you're integrated. Yeah, not salad m- melted into. Yeah, right, yeah. I don't want to <laughs> melt. I don't want to melt into anything. I like you, but <laughs> I would like to ref- really maintain my form. Uh, speaking about the melting pot, and speaking about this terminology, the, the final question I'll ask before I open up is, let's t- you know, we talk about JFK, right? So you got. Bridget, PJ, and it's still JFK, still the shining light for the Kennedys, mm-hmm. right? And in the late 50s, the ADL asked JFK, because he was being hazed as an Irish Catholic, to write about an essay about, you know, talk about your roots as an immigrant. ADL, of course, is concerned because the same hazing of Irish Catholics was being done to Eastern European Jews. Yep. So he writes this infamous Nation of Immigrants <coughs> essay, uh, which, you know, we still hold on, like the beacon. This mm-hmm. is a Nation of Immigrants. It's used by politicians to this day even as we're kicking out immigrants, but I digress. <laughs> if he were alive today and saw what happened in the past 60 years, and if he was asked to write the Nation of Immigrants essay today, how do you think he'd update it? Hmm. I know I'm asking you to do a lot, but you have the research and the expertise that I do not. <laughs> uh, you know, I think there were some things that he lobbied for in that essay, which became a book after he was killed, that were... Um, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, criticizing country of origin quotas that were, after his death in 1965, um, Immigration Act were, were repealed. So, so my parents got it. Yeah, and you write about it in your book. Yeah. Uh, a- and so that was uh, partly influenced by his uh, words in that, in that essay. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a, that's a great question and a really hard one. Um, I do think JFK was someone who appreciated where he came from. You know, it sort of skipped over Joe Kennedy, and and uh, JFK did go back to Ireland m- multiple times, gave a speech there a few months before he was killed, mm. um, spoke openly about the strength of the, the immigrant and their co- contributions to America, how we're all immigrants, blah, 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 like all that. All these ideals that we think actually represent how we conduct ourselves, which we know isn't, isn't the case. You know, what he would, how, how would he change it? Uh, in, uh, you know, especially over hearing what we've heard over the past few years. In fact, um, I had this quote that I just wanted to, well, I want to read Lincoln too, but um, you know, you have every, many other presidents, including those that I didn't like or agree with, saying the right things about immigration, right? Like continuing the messaging around uh, a nation of immigrants. And then, and then in our headlines, in recent years you hear, it's like an invasion. Why are we having all these people from shithole country, countries come here? These aren't people, these are animals. Mm. They're rapists. We should have more people from places like Norway. Um, you know, that's what this concept of a nation of immigrants is like t- transformed into. Good so immigrants. Yeah, the good ones. Yeah, the, the, the clean ones. Yeah. Um, it's just bonkers. It's nuts. Like, so what would I, what would JFK do if he saw what how we treat this concept now? I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm gonna p- push it back on you. What do you what do you think he would I change? I think if he was reminded of his otherness, like he was when he was running for president, he would lean in. And I think the reason why he couldn't escape it, much like Obama's, because it was thrown in his face and weaponized, mm-hmm. which is why Obama, like Kennedy, decided to lean in and craft a message. Of, of multiculturalism because that was a way of including himself and his narrative in the American narrative. That's what I think. If, if JFK was allowed to be white and pass, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. That's where I'm at. Maybe you guys disagree. 
Uh, I will ask, I'm, I'm out of time. I'll ask a question. Do we have any questions? Do we have a couple of minutes? Are you kicking us out? <laughs> All right. All right, thank you. I was struck by the, all right, just ask this question. I can't read the handwriting. Anyone? Mm -hmm. I was struck by the, you got it. Go for it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it's a big theme in the book because I really did want to, um, it, part of it was my, me learning more about what, not just my grandparents, I'm sure they faced discrimination, and I'm, I don't think it was nearly what the original Kennedys were up against. I, w I wanted this book to show us who we were back then um, and what comes out of that. You know, I, I, again, I talked about it earlier on. I didn't want this to be a Kennedy book. I wanted this largely to be a, a history book that shows us what this one particular family experienced, the hatred they faced, and how they were among the lucky ones mm. to emerge from that, right? Whatever combination of luck and, 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 and fortitude and tenacity allowed Bridget to overcome some of that crap, and then her son and onward, um, you know, I, I really wanted to, to have this be a celebration of an immigrant family making it in America despite every effort to prevent them from making it in America. And, and there's a quote, what's largely forgotten about the Kennedy saga is that it started with nothing, just a poor, hardworking, widowed grocer named Bridget and her four fatherless children in an East Boston tenement. Uh, someone has cheated and asked three questions on one card. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask two of the three questions because I'm generous. What professions did the Irish immigrants pursue in the U.S. at the time? You mentioned maids. Oh, yeah. And they, they were so, there were so many maids that were just called Bridget's. They were, yeah, it was interchangeable. Bridget or Biddy. Um, you know, the men, I describe how they're... Um, hi, Cheryl. <laughs> the men uh, who were the dudes back in Ireland came here, and they were digging ditches. Like, yeah. they, they ended up being grunts. Um, just manual labor, building the railroads, digging tunnels. They lost agency when they came here. And that takes a psychological toll that oftentimes people haven't written about and talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I think for the guys, it was hard. They, you know, eventually the second generation or first generation and second generation had more success, like PJ getting into the liquor business. But, um, but for a lot of them, they took on the lowest of low jobs and, uh, and died in great numbers as a result working in the mills. M women also got into um, uh, the mills up in Massachusetts working as seamstresses, and, uh, which is another job that my grandmother did. She was a maid, she was a seamstress, and she worked as a seamstress the rest of her life in public housing in New Jersey. If you, if you talk to many cab drivers here in DC, uh, uh, you'll find out, if you really talk to them, many of them, especially if they're Afghan refugees or from Iraq, you'll find out that they were like doctors. Yeah. You know, and 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 then you and then the parent, the kids my age, they're like, man, my dad was, he was something. And then, yeah. he, but the, the dad, some dads are like, no, it's okay, we got here and we survived. But then some of them, the pain that you know, I was a skilled, I was a man of like honor, and I'm mm -hmm. here, treated like crap. I, th I think that's the story that oftentimes doesn't get told of how it really affects men, yeah, immigrant men, yeah. Irish, uh, Eastern European Jews. It doesn't matter. It just. They had everything, and they came here, and you're just a piece of crap at the age of 40. From the bottom, again. starting yeah. from zero. Yeah, starting from zero. And then you can't be what you pursued. Yeah. Uh, you can't be the politician. You can't be the doctor. You can't be the lawyer. You can't be the poet. You're just the Uber driver. But you do it for your kids, and then yeah. they be get to. And they, yeah. But there, there's something that's, I think there's just a story that's oftentimes missing of that, that, that those men and what they had to face. Because as you know, as Spartan men of a certain generation, we just suffer quietly, and then we die at the age of 65 <laughs> from a heart attack. <laughs> you suffer quietly, don't say a word. Um, but, you know, and it, that's also in the Irish Catholic tradition, even with the South Asians. Right? Suffer quietly, be a man, don't say anything. Suck it up. Suck it up. Uh, but they sucked it up for their families, and, and you know, you had, you had a story of Bridget who was able to create this dynasty. What would the Irish have encountered in terms of culture shock at that time? Oh, I mean, they, you know, they, they, uh, everything. Uh, they came from poor farms. They were peasants, many of them. You know, not all, but Bridget was, Patrick was, the ones I'm writing about here. They, you land in a city. And then you land in a j big city. Yeah. I think what, it was the third biggest when they landed, th third biggest city in America. Uh, I could be off, but, um, you know, tall ships, tall buildings, relatively speaking, you know, trains and, and horse-drawn carriages, all this stuff that they never saw back home. Um, I described the maids, for, for example, working in modern, you know, wealthy families' kitchens 
with a stove. They never had a stove. They had a fire, mm. a fire pit and, a, and a, a hook where the, you know, the one pot swung on top of the fire and they cooked mm. their meal in the pot and then moved the pot out of the way. Um, you know, they didn't have a gas stove or indoor plumbing or any of this stuff. So they were overwhelmed by the, 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 the culture shock uh, of this new land. And, and to me, that makes it even more remarkable that right. women like Bridget figure it out you know, okay, I get it now. Um, I, I, I've been watching and observing. Now I understand how America works and then moves her way up and runs a grocery shop. I always find that I interesting when America, if you go back to, like you said, this is nothing new. Uh, it always mocks immigrants because I'm like, if anything, you should praise them. They come to a country where they don't know anybody. They have, they don't know the language. They learn the language. They build themselves up from scratch and they succeed. If anything, these people are like superheroes that we should emulate. Yeah. But we're, we're simultaneously either taking away all the jobs or we're very lazy. <laughs> I'm like, you got to pick a lane. You got to pick a lane. Uh, and you see the unfortunate parallels uh, of what was said against the Irish that's now being said against so many different groups. And your book kind of parallels that beautifully. I have time for one more question. Anyone? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? <laughs> all right, I'll ask it. Wh you know, we're in the, like you mentioned, there's uh, the rise of, uh, nativism, uh, white Christian nationalism in particular, mm -hmm. is, uh, is, a, is a, a threat. We've seen the texts of Ginny, T Ginny Thomas. Some <laughs> of us have. January 6th insurrection, the rise of white supremacist terrorism, the number one domestic terror threat in America, the rise of strongmen, authoritarianism, <laughs> Putin, Hungary, Orban, Trump, nativism, uh, the good immigrants, the bad immigrants, right? Uh, climate change and also, and also, <laughs> a pandemic which has killed six million, right? And so the question I ask folks is, with all this happening right now, what is giving you hope? Hmm. I think you almost answered for me. There's not much. It's hard to find hope right now. I'm, I'm being totally honest. It's, mm. a, it's a freaky, scary time. A, in my lifetime, you know, I was too young for Vietnam. Um, I, I, I haven't seen... Uh, a, a period of time in my lifetime that scared the shit out of me like it has now for all the reasons you, you just mentioned. You know, you try and stay, keep things close. I, I hope that my children will figure their shit out and become successful good people. They are good people. I hope they become successful men. Two boys I, I've raised, sort of, kind of. Quasi, um, yeah. Yeah, did you what could I could. You give an assist. I did what I could. Um, but hopeful, uh, you know, the political uh, scene scares the crap out of me. There are a few pockets of, of hope. You, you know, we, we talked about some, some members of Congress now who are sort of breaking through these barriers that had been in place for many years and, and uh, becoming the first mm. of their kind. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, among others, Michelle Wu in Boston. Yeah. First, you Amazing know. story. Yeah. Um, and I... And, uh, uh, that it's that generation of politicians that I that give me a little bit of hope, but I also know what they're up against, and it seems like a long way to go for them to have the influence that'll change things. Do you think we can recreate the narrative that's mentioned in your book? Because oftentimes we hold up the one magical immigrant, right? Yeah, like yeah. He got out. Yeah. PJ got out, uh, and then PJ got out, and then that means anyone can make it in America, and then we kind of forget all the people who were buried. Right. Uh, it, like all the Irish bodies that who, were buried. Who didn't make it. Who didn't make it. Which was most. Yeah, which was most. It's always been the case. Do, do you think there's, looking in the future, of course, I'm just asking you as like a father and as an American, like do you feel like this won't be the outlier story or we're still going through a period where we'll have outliers? We'll oh, I, de through. I, I definitely believe that. I mean, it, if you're asking about hope, yeah, I definitely have hope that there will be outliers that will that will help change things for the better. Um, this doesn't directly answer it, but, I, but there's, uh, I, I think about this a lot at times when I think about uh, what's next, what's gonna come out of this, who's gonna like, come out of the muck and show yeah. us to, uh, what, what they accomplished and, and inspire us somehow. East Boston, um, where Bridget and Patrick were from, it was all Irish during their day, um, pretty rough place to live, at least where they were. Uh, later the Italians took over, some Eastern European Jews in the early 1900s. Um, uh, and then uh, as I walk through there now, I've been there a few times over the past few years, um, in the, on the same street corners where you had PJ's Bar and Bridget's Grocery Store, there's a bodega. Mm. There's a little Latin American market, a little Central American market. It's very Latino now um, uh, and South American now. 
and I think that th this this little uh, community is I is reflective of who we are at our best, right? Like these immigrants coming to this country, starting up their little shops, hopeful, ambitious, probably full of the same grit and tenacity that Bridget had. Um, maybe they won't be the ones to make it, but maybe their children will. Um, and so seeing a community like that and seeing a community like this that we're in the middle of right now, uh, that kind of stuff gives me some hope. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Thompson. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Sorry that I was late. And whoever hasn't purchased a book, we know who you are. And, uh, and please buy a copy of Waj's watch, watch book. If you as have well. money, <laughs> but buy his book first. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. And thanks, Julia. And Politics and Prose. Thank you, Politics and Prose. Thank you so much. On behalf of Politics and Prose, one more round of applause for Neil Thompson, Wajaha Ali. Folks, thank you so much for coming. If you do need to grab signed copies of the first Kennedys, or we still have signed copies of Go Back to Where You Came oh From, nice. please head towards the registers um, outside in the store. We have them behind there. Um, do be advised, we are seating for a second event within 30 minutes, so we don't Get want out. you That's to- Get out, that's what she's saying. We Get want out. you to stick around, we want you to stick around, but your chairs can stay, but make sure that your personal effects are with you so those don't get left behind. Um, and thank you so much for coming out. We will see you again very soon. No, thank you, man. Thank you for inviting me. Great book. Uh, sorry that I was